Craig, this is the second time you've done this today. You never I, did, I did on all three with uh, state. On well, all three. I've got you uh, the record you, reflecting you just here on behalf of yourself. Um, but you're also here on behalf of the Texas Trial Lawyers Association. Yes. And I have your permission to correct the record. Yes. And you're against the bill. Yes. Okay. But not as much as I used to be. <laughs> okay. So, the, so yes. your, your position on behalf of yourself and TTLA is, is opposed to this the, the bill. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge and thank you as well as Mr. Munoz and the builders. We have met uh, many times to work through. And I think that the bill in front of you has less issues that we need to resolve than originally. So I think we've gotten rid of a lot of a lot of things. So that we understand what this provision is about, both uh, Vice Chair Johnson and Mr. Schofield, the concern of the builders was that a code violation, which was not causing any problems and never would cause a problem, what could be and had been subject to claims. The, the example that was used repeatedly was if the air conditioner slab is supposed to be six inches away from the fence and six inches away from the house, but is actually five inches away from both, and everybody, that would be a code violation. But it did not cause a problem and was not going to cause a problem. So that was, I felt that was a legitimate concern of the builders. And so this language is what we're trying to address there. We can't continue to work on it to get everybody comfortable with it because just like the language in um, uh, B says actual failure or lack of the capability of a building component to perform its intended function. So if you have a window that is installed improperly and one is leaking, another one is installed improperly but is not leaking yet, they both would be you know, a construction defect, right? So that's why a lack of capability to perform its intended function it was put in there. But it may not be the best, most perfect language, but so we, we can continue to work on that. Um, if you turn to the next page, um, two pages over, I'm sorry, on page seven, uh, six and seven, the one change which uh, Chairman Leach mentioned at the bottom on, on uh, line 21 of page six, says that when a homeowner uh, gives notice of a claim that they have to, um, previously it said on the request of the contractor, the claimant shall provide any evidence they have, right? So now whenever a claimant makes a claim, they have to provide uh, whatever information they have about the damage or defect. Good and fair, Keep going. right? I, I thought people would do it anyway. However, what we think is good for the goose and good for the gander is that when the builder makes their offer of repair, they should also provide any reports, photographs, evidence that they have along with their offer without the claimant being ha having asked for it, right? So if it's good, way, good one way, should be good for the rest. I thought that happened, but practitioners, they're looking at the bill, they brought to my attention, hey, this should go both ways. So we'll, I want to talk to you about that and we'll work on that. Um, next is on page 10. Uh, line 15. Uh, this is where if a, if a, if a homeowner failed to give all the information available said failed to provide the contractor evidence available at the time of the original notice. I think that we might want to consider their available or and in their possession, right? So that they have the information, that it's not just quote available. It's not a big deal, but it's something I wanted to talk to you about once I saw the, this final language and talk to the builders about as well. I mean, is that the right terminology or you know, not just available, but actually have it. Okay, so now let's talk about what what we believe should be added to the bill. Because as you said, this part of this is, is, is a 2002 or 1989 or 2002 bill, and we're modernizing, getting rid of stuff, making some tweaks. 
And so I, I want the members to understand when this bill was passed, I mean, the way I look at it is builders didn't want to get surprised and just get sued. They show up at the courthouse, didn't know anything had happened, right? And like a car wreck, you know that you've been in a car wreck, right? So you got notice of it. So they wanted notice of a problem, right? The homeowner doesn't always know what the problem is or how to fix it, but give the builder notice. Okay, we got that. The builder has to have an opportunity to come out and inspect um, and then make an offer of repair if they want to. We've done that and we've given the builders, you know, previously they could only come out once. We've given them three times to come out. You, they come out once, say, oh, we need an engineer, come out again, we need an engineer and HVAC, whatever. We've given them three <clears throat> opportunities to come out and inspect. Um, then we've extended the time for the repairs to be done because it's, you know, 45 days, but if it's a serious defect, you can't get it done in 45 days. So we've addressed that issue. So we go back to the purpose. Notice, opportunity to inspect, um, opportunity to make an offer of repair. Now, once that's done, the homeowner has a decision. All right, do I accept that offer or reject it? If you accept it, it's all over and everybody goes home happy. If you reject it, now the homeowner has to go to litigation or arbitration and if they prove that the offer was unreasonable, they have the homeowner should be made whole. Because what that means is the builder came out and inspected and made an offer. The arbitrator or the jury said that offer was unreasonable. So the homeowner was correct in pursuing the litigation or arbitration. If that is true, if there's a construction defect, and there was an unreasonable offer, so the homeowner had to go to litigation, they should be made whole. The homeowner should be made completely whole. And the bill provides that, the statute provides that. It says the homeowner can get attorney's fees. The homeowner can get engineering uh, costs and expert costs. And, but here's the problem. And this bill applies to both original owners and subsequent purchasers, okay? Up until 2019, everybody thought that if you prove those two things, um, unreasonable offer and, and, and proved it that you got made whole by getting your attorney's fees, expenses paid. The Supreme Court said, well, the legislature said that the that the homeowner may be able to recover this uh, category of damages, but the statute doesn't create a cause of action. And so since the legislature said may and did not say shall, then the, legisl then the homeowner has to prove a s additional cause of action that gives you attorney's fees. So you gotta prove DTPA violations. You have to prove a uh, breach of contract. Well, a subsequent purchaser cannot prove a uh, cannot prove a breach of contract. Subsequent purchaser can't prove DTPA because nothing was represented to them or her. And so what I have passed out to y'all, the Mitchell case. And what the Mitchell case um, said by the Supreme Court is the builder, and if I was a, if I was a builder, I would go in every case and, and plead negligent and admit negligence. Because if I admit negligence, you cannot recover attorney's fees or expenses. And that's exactly what happened in the Mitchell case. They stipulated negligence, right? And the Supreme Court said, yeah, you don't need to get any fees because under negligence cause of action, there's no way to recover attorney's fees because the legislature said may and not shall. So what I'm asking this uh, committee to do as we're updating the bill, because up till 2019, everybody, I mean, until this case, thought that if you prove unreasonable offer, you got made whole, which means you got your attorney's fees. So I would ask you to change may to shall in the statute. And then secondly, and uh, you, we should not, this, this bill, uh, this statute, um, you know, I would say it is builder friendly. Um, but you should, this is the statute. So you shouldn't be able to change it you, by contract and so we need to put that in this statute because here's what 
I have experienced in my cases, um, and I don't do this a lot, but I'm, you know, I have them right now. But contract says this, you know, you're buying a house. This contract is subject to RECLA. Okay, I know that. I know what it says. This contract is subject to arbitration. Ah, okay. Well, I know I got to go do that. The arbitrator can award anything or law or equity. Okay, I can handle that. Fourth, each side bear their own attorney's fees and cost of arbitration. Well, wait a minute. I thought if I proved an unreasonable offer, I got my attorney's fees. Well, no, you waived that by contract. So I think that we ought to put in the statute that your rights and remedies cannot be increased, decreased, changed, Look here, this is your rights and remedies. And with that said, finally, we well, need to add to the things that can be recovered if you prove an unreasonable offer and a construction defect is that you get your court cost or arbitration fees. Because arbitration fees can be $20,000 to arbitrate one of these. And so if a homeowner goes to, arbit is, goes to arbitration instead of litigation, you know, litigation costs you $350 to file a lawsuit. Arbitration costs you $20,000. And if you have to pay that $20,000, you get your attorney's fees, yay. You get your experts paid for, yay. But now you got to pay $20,000 for arbitration. You can never be made whole. So I would uh, ask that those, we, we have addressed those. I'd like to could make that change in the final. <clears throat> members questions for Craig okay uh, Craig thanks where go ahead 